In this chapter, we'll review the audio editing tools available in Cubase 7. There are two primary goals for this chapter. First, to make sure you're acquainted with some of the fundamental editing concepts. And second, to make sure that you're aware of all the tools at your disposal. Even highly experienced Cubase users have been heard to say, I didn't know it would do that. And we're going to try to minimize that effect for you. By the end of this chapter, you should have a solid understanding of non-destructive editing, new version versus reference, the importance of key commands, the various toolbars, the use of handles and fades, and how to adjust the snapping behavior. The first thing I want to talk about is non-destructive editing. This means that the original audio file is never altered. And this means that you can undo any changes. And many of those changes can be undone in any order. Now, there are two ways to review changes. The first and simplest is under the Edit menu called History. Now, here you'll see all of your recent changes as a list, and you can drag the horizontal divider to undo and redo events in sequence. Now, this list only contains changes made since the project was open, and this list is cleared when you close the project. A more advanced option is the Offline Edit History found on the Audio menu. Select an audio event and open the Offline Edit History dialog. This menu shows changes made to a specific audio event. Use the buttons to modify, replace, or remove processing. Now this selective undo is possible because Cubase makes changes only to the clip, not the original file. So as you make changes in the offline process history, Cubase simply rearranges the clip's instructions. The offline process history also remains with the event even after you close and reopen the project. Now, as you make edits to your project, Cubase will often ask you to pick between referencing a clip or creating a new version. Now, let's clarify what Cubase is really asking by looking at what's going on in the background. Now, as we just discussed, when you edit an audio event, you're just changing the instructions for its clip. But remember that a single clip can be shared by several events, and that's where this dialogue comes into play. Here's an example. Let's take a single drum loop as our audio event. Since we have an event, we also have a clip in the background. If we duplicate the drum loop, we get multiple events, but we still only have the one clip, which is shared by all of them. Now, if we edit one of the events, Cubase will ask how to proceed. Now, what you choose depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If your editing creates a special effect that you only want in one spot, then you need to select Create New Version. This creates a new clip with the special effect and leaves everything else unchanged. But if you're removing a flaw or fixing a mistake, you probably want that change applied to all of the events, in which case select Reference. Now let's review the various editing tools beginning with the project window. Try to get in the habit of switching tools with a key command instead of the mouse. As a rule of thumb, using the key commands will make you about four times faster. In fact, for most of these videos, I'll be using the mouse specifically to slow things down and make it easier for you to follow. Now, first up is the Object Selection Tool, or Pointer. Now, it has three different modes, which can change by pressing the number one key several times, or by using the drop-down menu. The different modes affect how the resize function behaves. Now, in the following examples, keep an eye on how the waveform reacts when we resize the event. In normal mode, dragging an event handle hides or reveals more of the underlying audio. This is similar to the way cropping works with a picture in most programs. If you need to remove material from the end of an event, resizing is more efficient than cutting and erasing. The next mode is Move Contents. In this mode, resizing pulls the waveform along with the handle. Now, at first glance, this looks like you're just moving the event but notice that the other end remains anchored. And finally, we have Time Stretch. In this mode, when you resize an event, the audio will speed up or slow down to fill in the new size, like this. Changing modes only affects how resizing works. You can use any pointer to adjust things like the volume handles or to use the menus. Now, one other trick, if you hold the Option command and Command keys, then click and drag, you can slide the waveform around inside the event, and this can be handy when aligning sound effects. 
Next up is the Range tool. Use this to select a portion of an event as opposed to the entire event. The scissors, glue, and eraser tools are self-explanatory. Next is the magnifying glass. This can be a little confusing because there is a similar icon in Media Bay. This magnifying glass allows you to zoom in by clicking, and if you hold the Shift key and click again, you'll zoom back out. Media Bay's magnifying glass is used to identify the quick search field. The X tool is used to mute and unmute events within a track. The muted events will be grayed out. Next is the Comp tool. Use this for working with lanes. This one tool allows you to slice all the lanes with a single click, then click on the parts that you want to hear without having to switch tools. Next is the Time Warp tool. This is often used to synchronize the project's tempo with pre-recorded music. Time Warp requires an active tempo track, and we'll go over this in a later chapter, but in a nutshell, you can use Time Warp two ways. You can slide your tempo track around to match the music, or you can stretch the music to match your tempo track. The pencil tool can be used in several ways. You can create empty events in the project window. You can draw in automation points. You can even draw in complex volume curves called envelopes right on an audio event. Hover over an audio event and watch the volume curve symbol appear next to the pencil. Now click inside the event to create the curve points that represent volume. You can create as many as you need, and if you copy the event, the curve goes with it. The pencil tool also has a hidden function. Select an event and hover over the lower right corner. When you press and hold the Alt key, a special pencil tool activates, which you can click and drag to duplicate events. The Pencil tool has more functions inside the Sample Editor, which we'll see in a moment. Next is the Line tool. The Line tool is one of the most overlooked tools in Cubase. The Line tool has several modes, and it can help you make complex edits really rapidly. Now let's illustrate this with some automation data. The default mode is handy for creating linear ramps, but look at the complex results that we can generate using the other modes. Curves like this can generate awesome effects when applied to panning, send levels, or modulation, and especially with MIDI data. The period of the curve matches the active grid, so to change the curve, simply change the grid. The speaker tool is used for spot checking playback, and it has two modes, play and scrub. In play mode, you click and hold at the location where you want to start playback. In scrub mode, you click and then drag forwards and backwards to scrub a section. The paint can can be used to recolor selected events or tracks. And you can open these select colors to customize your color palette. And here you can create and adjust colors. You can name colors for use with specific types of tracks. And you can also adjust the overall brightness and contrast, which is handy if you're in variable lighting conditions like a live event. And of course, you can restore the factory default settings. This section of the toolbar lets you designate a root key for your project. Now, this is useful if you're going to transpose your project or portions of it later. Also, once you define a root key, most of the loops that you import will be transposed automatically into this key. The next tool is the Snap to Zero Crossing tool, and this is basic but important. When zero crossing is active, any cuts that you apply will automatically be shifted to happen at points where the mathematical amplitude is zero, and this is done to help avoid pops, clicks, or sudden jumps in volume. Next is the Snap On and Off control. With Snap turned on, Cubase automatically adjusts the position of anything that you move by aligning it with the grid. Well, there are several types of snap. Grid is the most basic type, and in this mode, events will jump to the next increment, the active grid. The grid relative mode is interesting. 
Let's say that you have an event that falls just a half a beat behind the bar. In grid relative mode, you can move the event and it will maintain that same half beat offset wherever you drop it. In events mode, the events themselves become magnetic and will snap to each other. This includes markers. In shuffle mode, the snap function will automatically reposition surrounding events to accommodate new ones. It prevents overlaps and works a little like sliding blocks around. And finally, there are a series of magnetic cursor modes. In any of these modes, events will automatically snap to the cursor. The other modes allow you to select combinations of magnetic behaviors like snapping to the grid and the cursor, or snapping to each other and the cursor, and so forth. The next section defines the grid that Cubase uses when applying snap. The options depend on how you have your ruler set up. If it's set to bars and beats, then your grid options are shown in bars and beats. If you switch the ruler into timecode, then your grid options are shown in timecode. And one more note about snapping. You can adjust what part of an event is used as the reference point. Now, by default, Cubase will use the start of an event as its snap point. But when we open the sample editor, we'll see how to reposition the snap point. Finally, you can adjust some basic quantize settings right from the toolbar. You can select between hard quantize or iterative quantize. You can set the quantize resolution, or you can open the quantize control panel, which we'll cover in a little while. Now let's move on to chapter four and look at the rest of the tools and the audio menu.